OK, so after going through that exercise, hopefully we can see how uh, different configurations of GAP and GEF uh, allow this system to produce regulated amounts of RAS-GTP in the cell in response to different stimuli. Um, uh, and if that logic still isn't clear, I suggest just go back through that little um, understanding check and kind of work it out. Um, it's not super complicated. It's just, you know, it's just uh, some terminology and figuring out who's an activator, who's an inactivator. Um, okay, but once we know that these molecules exist, we've got RAS GEFs, we've got RAS GAPs, we've got effectors. Um, you know, we're biochemists, so how do these GEFs and GAPs actually work? Uh, you know, how are they able to accelerate these different reaction steps? And then how in turn are they regulated? Because it's the amount of active GEF or active GAP, as you saw in our understanding check, that's going to set how much RAS-GTP is in the cell. So if we can understand how those are regulated, then we can understand how the levels of RAS-GTP inside the cell are regulated as well. So let's go through each one of these uh, GEFs and GAPs one by one and figure out how they work, and then figure out how they can be regulated. So let's start with the GEFs, because these are the things that turn RAS on. Um, and so the way that RAS is uh, RAS GEFs are able to accelerate nucleotide exchange is through what is called a CDC25 domain. And so you're seeing here a crystal structure of the CDC25 domain here interacting uh, with RA the RAS GTPase that you see here. And remember, this RAS is very slow to exchange nucleotide normally. Um, and the reason for that, if you look at the structure of just plain old RAS by itself bound to GTP, is look at how intimate the contacts between the RAS GTPase and this GTP, uh, this nucleotide here is is buried very deep. There's a lot of contacts between these components, and so it's hard for the RAS GTPase to release that protein because it kind of has, you know, uh, two lips binding or you know, top and bottom both binding to uh, the nucleotide. And so what these guanine exchange factors are able to do is they actually insert this big helical hairpin, which is able to displace this bottom segment here that you see here. And what this does is by inserting this in here, you now free up a lot of room to allow for this nucleotide to be able to escape the active site. And so let's look at this in a little bit more structural detail. Again, I don't expect you to, you know, I'm not asking you to know which residues are intimately involved in binding, but to just take a more intimate look, there are a lot of, mo of residues in the GTPAs when it's uh, all by itself, in which there's an intimate hydrogen bonding network that's helping it hold on and grasp onto this nucleotide. And once you've inserted this helical hairpin in there, many of the uh, residues, in particular within this switch one region here, um, those hydrogen bonds to the GTPase are disrupted. And this has the effect of basically loosening the GTPase's grip on the system. Uh, here's just another way of kind of looking in that in cartoon format, in which again, Absent the GEF, uh, we've got the triphosphates here of our nucleotide, and we can see a lot of intimate contacts here, hydrogen bonding network, van der Waals interactions, etc., holding on to this GTP. And when we insert this uh, hairpin uh, from the CDC25 molecule, uh, this network here is disrupted. So, um, you know, you can pause and look at this kind of and see, wow. We went from being very tightly bound to this thing to now um, the the CDC25 domain is sort of out competing a lot of the interactions needed to bind very tightly. Um, now, as I said, this is the core domain that's responsible for producing nucleotide exchange with uh, RAS GTPases, but you'll almost never see this domain all by itself in terms of the molecules that are responsible for activating the GTPase. Instead, you'll see them embedded in more complex proteins that contain other uh, domains. And these other domains are what are going to be responsible to control exactly when the activity of the CDC25 domain uh, is allowed to uh, exert its influence. Um, and so this, these accessory domains through either localizing the protein to different places or providing auto-inhibitory interactions are going to allow for input-specific regulation of different GEF molecules. And so let's take a moment and talk a little bit more about one such molecule called SOS, or uh, SOS, um, which stands for Son of Sevenless. Um, and this is sort of like the case study. This is the paradigm for thinking about regulated GEF activity. Um, and this uh, GTPA signaling is triggered by binding, or is triggered by the binding of growth 
uh, factors to uh, uh, growth factor receptors um, in the cell, uh, which you may have learned about uh, in previous lectures. And as you'll recall, when um, these different uh, factors bind to their receptors, they trigger the uh, the phosphorylation of a variety of uh, tyrosine residues on the internal side of the signaling receptor. And um, what these phosphotyrosines do, actually, this is very interesting, is that they provide a platform to recruit uh, a guanine exchange factor, this son of seven list GAF, to the plasma membrane. And they do so by uh, through this uh, adapter protein called GRAB2. And what this protein does is basically it binds to phosphotyrosines, and it also binds to the son of seven list GEF. And so what you can imagine is that when uh, this receptor gets phosphorylated to produce these phosphotyrosines, through this GRAB2 adapter, it's going to recruit this GEF protein, son of seven list, to the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane, of course, is where the RAS GTPase is located. And so the receptor tyrosine kinase being activated will localize SOS to the membrane, allowing it to activate the RAS GTPase. Okay, so we actually have, in this case, an example of one signaling system you've learned about, receptor tyrosine kinases, uh, driving uh, recruitment of a regulator of RAS GTPA signaling. So you're connecting these two modules together here. Um, so in addition to simply recruiting um, SOS to the membrane, which does have a profound effect on its activity, um, there are also auto-inhibitory interactions uh, in the son of 7 list GEF that would ordinarily restrict its uh, the CDC25 domain's activity against RAS. So like if you took this protein in vitro and you mixed it with RAS, you'd find that it doesn't do a very good job of activating. And that's because all these different domains that you see here are kind of blocking uh, the critical uh, sites on the CDC25 molecule that are needed to activate RAS. And so if we want to go just into a little bit more detail about how these different auto-inhibitory interactions can be used to tune the activity, of a GEF. Um, there's a beautiful paper uh, that I suggest you check out if you're interested uh, in, in these questions, uh, in which they explored how all the different subdomains of the son of seven list GEF contribute to uh, the overall GEF activity uh, when uh, different ligands or signaling inputs are provided to the system. And basically, the way you should think about this is that, again, we have this core CDC25 domain here whose function is to interact with RAS and promote its activation, converting it to RAS GTP and promote downstream signaling. But then in addition, we have all these accessory domains whose function is to regulate when and where uh, CDC20, this CDC25 domain activity uh, is allowed to occur. Uh, so for example, there is this pH domain here that interacts with a special type of lipids uh, called PIP2, the plasma membrane. There is a REM domain that binds to activated uh, RAS, and this provides a sort of positive feedback loop uh, in the system. And of course, there is this um, interaction site for the GRAB2 protein that uh, regulates uh, its interaction with uh, growth factor bound receptor tyrosine kinases. And so the combination of this core catalytic domain with these accessory uh, domains that interact with other ligands allows for SOS to be able to integrate PIP2 density, activated RAS density, and the RTK phosphorylation state to control CDC25, uh, the CDC25 domain's activity towards the RAS GTPase. Okay, and so we went here from having just a domain that has the CDC25 domain to a molecule that now uh, controls how much of that CDC25 activity is allowed to uh, exist under different conditions inside the cell. And this is kind of a general theme that you'll see for many of the GEFs, uh, as well as GAPs, as well as signaling molecules in general inside the cell. And so I don't expect you to memorize, you know, I'm not saying no, that SOS responds to PIP2 and GRAB2, but rather uh, get you thinking about how a core catalytic activity can be regulated by these accessory modules. Okay, so how about, we've talked about GEFs, so how about GAP proteins? How do those work? Uh, how is a, a molecule able to accelerate the turnoff of RAS? And so um, the way that GTPase activating proteins work is they have a domain, uh, 
called a RASGAP domain that functions to stimulate GTP hydrolysis. And so here you're looking at a crystal structure of uh, RAS uh, interacting with a RASGAP. Uh, and they used a clever trip to trap the um, RAS GTPase uh, in a state in which they could see the gap interacting with it. They used a transition state analog here, GDP aluminum uh, fluoride. Uh, so that they could capture this complex in the act of trying to perform chemistry on the GTPase. And this would enable them to figure out how, to, how does this thing actually work. And what they found was that the uh, uh, gap domain inserts a finger loop into the active site of RAS. So basically, it pokes something here into the uh, active site where that GTP is bound. And if we sort of zoom in, what we see is that this little finger loop contains an arginine residue in it, and that arginine residue is able to interact very nicely uh, with the uh, negatively charged uh, phosphates of the nucleotide. And so that arginine figure is basically able to stabilize the developing charge that uh, is occurring uh, on the gamma phosphate, that is the part, the phosphate that's going to be hydrolyzed off of the GTP, and sort of stabilize it as that happens to sort of facilitate this from going on. And the other thing that RASGAPs do is they stabilize the GTPA structure in such a way that the GTPA is better able to perform catalysis. And so if we look um, in the structure, uh, of RAS interacting with this RAS gap, there's a critical catalytic residue here called RAS Q61L. And when this loop is inserted, this Q61 is able to adopt a conformation that is uh, well ordered and pointed in an excellent position to be able to participate in the hydrolysis chemistry that's going on here. And you should note that in um, structures of RAS. Uh, that aren't interacting with the gap, you can't even see electron density for this loop. It's very poorly ordered. And so what that means is that normally this residue that's important for catalysis is not positioned well to participate. But when the RAS gap inserts this finger loop, uh, it helps order uh, this loop and position the Q61 to participate in catalysis. And so what this means is that the gap, RAS gap domain is actually able to stimulate GTP hydrolysis reaction greater than 10,000 fold. And so, you know, this is just some data uh, from, a, from a paper showing that in the absence of gap, uh, the, if you're monitoring the hydrolysis of RAS GTP, uh, ordinarily it's incredibly slow. So without any gap presence, it can take uh, over, it can take hours in order for this thing to even turn over half of its uh, uh, half of its substrate. But as soon as you include even tiny amounts of gap, like 125 nanomolar, whoosh, boom, uh, you just, uh, the reaction goes so fast. Um, and uh, so this basically means that when you have an active gap domain, you can rapidly turn off this GTPAs. And as before with the GEF, these gap domains, don't exist in isolation typically, but are instead embedded in more complex multi-domain signaling proteins. So I'm just showing you a few examples uh, that exist in human cells in which you've got a lot of different proteins that all have these RAS gap domains. Uh, and they are associated with a bunch of other domains that provide um, localization or regulatory inputs. And so just like with that CDC25 GEF, embedding allows RAS gap activity uh, to be regulated and tuned by different signaling inputs in different contexts. And that, again, is going to be able to control when a cell decides when to turn on a gap or turn on a GTPase or turn off that GTPA. Um, and so, again, just to kind of give you uh, an example of this, if we look, uh, if we go back and we look at uh, that receptor tyrosine kinase signaling, in which we know that phosphorylation of the receptor leads to the assembly of that son of seven list GAF to activate RAS. Interestingly, the P120 RAS gap contains domains that also recruit it to the receptor tyrosine kinase as well. So they have these SH2 domains that interact with those phosphotyrosines. And so when this receptor gets activated, your P120 gap is going to get recruited to the same location where RAS is being activated. And um, Basically, this enables um, 
the system to initially turn on the RAS GTPase, but by also recruiting this gap, uh, you can control uh, the amplitude, how much RAS GTP is produced, or even turn the system off completely uh, through a negative feedback. And so this is just kind of an example of how uh, GEF, GAP, and GTPase can be regulated through their interaction with a receptor uh, to produce a signaling output. So I hope by the end of today's lecture, you have learned how uh, the biochemical basis now for how RAS uh, signaling works and how the RAS GTPase is able to act as a molecular switch controlling the interaction of proteins from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane. And so just to review what I told you and the key points to take away and understand, RAS is a molecular switch at the plasma membrane. And in order to function as a switch, RAS is a very slow GTPase. And when RAS is GTP bound, it's in an on state. And when it's GDP bound, it's in an off state. RAS is activated by guanine exchange factors that promote uh, formation of the GTP bound state of RAS. And RAS is inactivated by GTPase activating proteins or gaps that facilitate hydrolysis of GTP bound RAS to GDP bound RAS. And finally, GTP RAS is able to signal by the binding to different RAS effector molecules. And this interaction has the effect of localizing those effectors to the plasma membrane, and in some cases even allosterically activating them to turn on their activity. And uh, from these simple rules and simple logic, um, cells are able to build an incredibly diverse repertoire of signaling systems that uh, communicate different inputs to different outputs inside the cell by building these multi-domain GEF and GAPs. Uh, they can connect to different signaling inputs uh, uh, to communicate to different signaling outputs. Um, and what we'll learn about on Wednesday is how this core logic and paradigm can thus be used to understand an array of very different cell signaling pathways that perform different functions that is all based on this simple uh, procedure for turning on and off this GTPase. Um, and that is basically the core of today's lecture. And if you're interested to know how we came to understand anything about these RAS signaling pathways at all, watch the companion video uh, that I've made here that's just going to walk you through a little bit of the history of RAS uh, signaling and how we came to know that. Otherwise, I'll see you on Wednesday uh, for uh, a discussion about how this RAS paradigm uh, is used to build a whole bunch of different signaling pathways. See you then.